of uh, this book on Hosea, uh, Jamie uh, Palmer uh, came up to me and said, are you familiar with Michael Card's song, Gomer? And uh, some of you know who Michael Card is. He's a Christian guitar player, and I wasn't, uh, but he's written a song on Gomer, and uh, I'm planning on maybe sharing a little bit about that song with you next week. But this morning, we're in the latter part of chapter, I I should say, uh, chapter 3, James uh, Montgomery Boyce says, listen to this now, says that Hosea chapter 3 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. That's what he says. It's the greatest chapter in the Bible. Anyhow, that's next week. So that's just a that's just a hook to get you back next week. Okay, we're in chapter two uh, this week, the latter part of chapter two. I'm going to begin reading at verse fourteen. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to count. I'd like for you to count the times the word will w i l l is in these words. Now I'm reading from the New International Version. That may not be your version, but if you'd like to even just listen and count them as we go, I'll ask you a little bit later on in the service how many you got. Verse 14 of Hosea chapter 2, it says, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and will no longer call me my master. I will remove my names. I will remove the names of Baal from her lips. No longer will her names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the birds of the air and with the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword of the battle, I will abolish from the land, so that all may lay down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in the righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain and the new wines and oil. And they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those who called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. And that uh, brings us to the end of chapter uh, chapter 2, where we will focus our attention uh, here this morning. Can we, uh, can we pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, and I thank you for, uh, thank you for your word, thank you for uh, your prophet, thank you, Lord, for the message that you um, gave to him, Lord, to give to us. And even though, Lord, we sit literally uh, nearly 3,000 years uh, from that day, Lord, this message is so relevant for us, we pray, Lord, that we might glean something that would be helpful, Lord, in our lives today. Help us, Lord, to be uh, people that desire to follow after you. Help us, Lord, to know what that means. Help us to understand uh, the leadings of your spirit as we understand your word so that we would know how to, first of all, believe and to think. And, Lord, know how to live. Uh, Live, Lord, righteously for you in a very unrighteous world. We thank you, Lord, for this world in which we live in, and we pray that we would continue to be a bright light for you. Father, may people be drawn to Jesus uh, through the ministry and through the people of this church. I thank you, Lord, especially for those that stood here on this platform just a few moments ago. Thank you, Lord, for their lives and for what you have done uh, in the past for them. And, Lord, what they choose to do for you here in this place. And we commit to you, Lord, these as well as everyone else that calls Faith Baptist Church their home. May truly, Lord, we uh, represent you well in our community, in our world uh, this, this year. Thank you, Lord, for this message this morning here in this latter part of this chapter, and we pray that we might just benefit from it and uh, that, Lord, ultimately you would receive the honor and the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to uh, admit 
before you this morning that uh, this book of Hosea so far has proven to be a pretty depressing book thus far. Uh, this is actually week number uh, week number four, I believe, in the study. And I realize that it's not a it's not necessarily a happy, a cheerful, a, a blessed story. Uh, you think what was what was Hosea thinking? Uh, what was he thinking when God instructed him to go and to and to marry this this young girl, this pretty young girl named Gomer? Uh, makes you wonder what was going through Hosea's mind in those early early days. Uh, I expect it was a nice wedding. Most weddings are nice. Most of them are. I expect uh, the wedding was nice. I expect the days that followed were nice. But at some point, shortly after their union, things started to go bad. And they went from from bad to worse. To the point where we were last Sunday morning, if you were here with us, uh, we saw uh, Gomer, uh, we believe, head off into the shadows of the night to, yes, uh, practice her trade of prostitution. I hate it when I get misunderstood uh, things that I say, and I realize that happens more than, uh, more than I wish. Uh, last week, I spoke to you about the, the urgency of our marital vows, and I spoke uh, even from my own personal family and spoke about the pain that, that, that we know and I'm sure the pain that you know when, when sometimes family members don't always keep those marital vows. And I know that I alarmed some of you. I think some of you th- thought I was speaking personally of, of me and uh, just by the reaction I got from some of you. So, uh, so please, uh, please don't be alarmed. Um, do, do you have any crazy family members in your family? Anybody? Raise your hand. Oh, my goodness. Look at all the hands go up. Well, you know, we do too. <laughs> I do, Cheryl does, and uh, you know, sometimes people that are close to us don't make wise decisions, and, uh, and I think we've all experienced that in our, in our extended families, and uh, even, unfortunately, even in our church family as well. But the good news is, and I do have good news uh, that I share with you today, the good news is that here in the latter part of chapter 2, we begin to see things, things turn around. Matter of fact, we see a little bit of hope, a little bit of optimism, and, and dare I say, we see you know, this love story that I spoke to you about early, early in the beginning of this study, and you think, well, where is this love story? Well, we begin to see it a little bit more here today. I've titled this message, The Greatest Lovers of All Time. If, if we were to uh, compile today a list of some of the, some of the greatest uh, couples or individuals when, when it comes to being great lovers in the history of the world. I wonder who we would put on that list, if we could compile a list together here this morning. I expect that if we took the time to do that, I, I would expect that probably Romeo and Juliet would, I expect, be on most of our lists. Even if you're not a Shakespeare fan, at least we recognize them as being great, great lovers. Um, you know, who, who, the, the list goes on and on. We could talk about, uh, we could talk about Robin Hood and Maid Marian. We could talk about Sir Lancelot and Guinevere. Remember that story a little bit, some of you? Uh, for those of you that are movie buffs, we could talk about Scarlett O'Hara and Brett uh, Rhett, uh, Butler. Um, we could talk about, who else could we talk about? Well, we could talk about, dare we say, uh, dare we say uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. You know, we could talk about them. Uh, we could talk about who else could we talk about? We could talk about well, talk about we could talk about JFK and and Jackie and Marilyn and you know the list goes on and on, right? Who else we could talk about? We could talk about um, Princess Grace, Prince Rainier the Third. That was a great story for those of you that remember that. We could talk about um, Elvis, Priscilla. That's a story, right? That's a story. Beatles fans, <laughs> remember Yoko, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, you know, list goes on and on. What about the lady and the tramp? Now there's a love story, right? <laughs> there's a love story. And of course, I would be amiss if I did not mention Shrek and Fiona, right? Okay, there's a love story. If you had to compile a list of describing the great love stories History, who would be on your list? 
Hosea takes the place among the greatest lovers of all ages, writes Dr. Kyle Yates. Did you hear that? I want to say that again. That Hosea, this prophet, he's a prophet, he's a preacher. He's a Jew. He's from Samaria. This this prophet Hosea takes his place among some of the greatest lovers of all time. Yates goes on to say this. He says that his love was so strong that the vilest behavior could not dull it. That's not what we think of when we think of great lovers. That's not what we think of when we think of romance in our world today. And yet I tell you this morning, folks, that is a great, great love story. Even if you don't know her music, even if you don't know her movies, even if you don't know her stardom, I expect that everybody knows who Jennifer Lopez is. Jennifer Lopez is certainly in, uh, I guess what we would call today, she's in Hollywood's elite. She has become a, uh, how can I say this? She has become a, a sex icon, a sex symbol, I guess, in many ways in our world today to our generation. Uh, she's donned the cover of how many uh, magazines. I expect that if we headed into the grocery store right now or to a newsstand, we'd see her face on several of those magazines. Just this past November, she, uh, she released her very first book. And uh, it's, called, it's called True Love. It's called True Love. And I guess it was the title that really grabbed my attention first, True Love. Now, I'm not, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be critical of her. I have nothing against her. Because her story really represents so many stories in the world. And yet, I ask the question, what does she know about true love? Now, according to her uh, disc list, she has written over, over, I shouldn't say written, she has recorded over 60 songs that have the word love in the title. So that should make her an authority on love, right? If we look at her story, if we look at her story just just briefly, it's not a great story. Um, over the course of her public life, she has been in and out of numerous relationships. Uh, she's been married actually three times. Two of those marriages didn't last a year. And by her own admission... She is a disaster at relationships by her own admission. And yet the world would look at her as someone who knows romance. The world will listen to her music and and, and get the message that she really knows how to, to love a man. That's the message that we would get. And yet I'd like to suggest to you this morning, she knows absolutely nothing about true love. And yet Hosea, Hosea knows what true love is all about. True love is selfless. True love is sacrificial. True love is there at the end of the day, regardless of what happened that day. And that's the kind of love that Hosea had for Gomer. And that's what begins to shine through here in the latter part of chapter 2, where we are today. A few minutes ago, I I read the last 10 verses of chapter uh, chapter 2, and I ask you to count the wills, W-I-L-L, in that passage of Scripture. How many did you get? Boys, really, all of Nobody's even got it right. Who said 23? Rob, there is no prize. But if there was, you'd get it. (laughs) If my counting is right. (laughs) 23 times the word will is used. Uh, 13 times the statement I will is used. Do you know the first part of chapter 2 talked about, if you were here last week, we talked about Gomer's sins. 
We, we t- kind of laid it on the line. What, what did Gomer do that was so wrong? And, and last week we talked about three years. We talked about her unfaithfulness, her adultery. We talked about also her ungratitude. And we talked about her being unreal, that she just wore the makeup. She wore the facade. That's who she was. We talked about her sins last week, the things that she did. Do you know what we're going to talk about in the latter part of chapter 2? We're going to talk about what Hosea says he's going to do. Last week we saw what Gomer did, and now we're going to look at these wills. I will, Gomer. I will, Gomer. I will, Gomer. We're going to look at the I wills and, and what Hosea says he will do for this woman he calls his wife. Now, we're not going to look at 23 of them. We're not going to even look at 13 of them. But I would like to look at five of them with you this morning. Five, I guess you could say they're promises. Five promises that Hosea makes makes to his wife, Gomer. The first one is in verse 14. It says in verse 14, uh, Therefore, I am now going to allure her, and I will lead her into a desert, And speak tenderly to her. I'd like to suggest to you that the first thing that Hosea is going to do, he says, I will allure her or I will lead her. The dictionary defines the word allure as to entice or to uh, attract something uh, with something that is desirable. And that's what Hosea says here to his wife, Gomer. He says, I want to allure you. Now, I remind you that as he makes that statement... As he makes that statement, she is still practicing her trade behind those closed doors. And yet he makes that statement anyway. He says to her, I will allure you. I will, what does he say? He says, I will, I will lead you, I will lead you to the desert and speak tenderly to you. I couldn't help but think if, if any one of us was in Hosea's shoes. Would we be speaking tenderly to the one that has hurt us so much? Can I ask you today, what what are you doing to allure or to entice your spouse? I bet you've never been asked that in church before, have you? Jonathan uh, Gottman is a uh, a research uh, scientist on the subject of marriage. And he divides most married couples uh, into two different groups. He refers to them as masters or disasters. (laughs) I'm not sure which one you fall into. But he makes makes a really good point in illustrating uh, what you need to do to become a master and avoid being a disaster. I I read to you his his study uh, he did a few years ago in his... Uh, study which took six years, uh, Gottman uh, carefully observed 130 couples. And he noticed that throughout the day, married couples and partners made requests for connections with each other. He refers to them as bids, B-I-D-S. For example, a husband who is a bird enthusiast might notice a gold finch flying across the yard, and he yells to his wife, look at that beautiful bird. He's not just commenting on the bird. He's requesting a response from his wife, a sign of interest or support, hoping that they'll connect, however momentarily, over that simple little bird. The wife now has a choice. She can respond by either turning toward or, as he says, turning away from her husband. Though the bird bid might seem very minor, it actually reveals a lot about the health of a marriage. The bird was important to the husband And the question is whether his wife will recognize and respect that. People who turn towards their partner, the study, uh, excuse me, people who turn towards their partners in the study responded by engaging the bidder, showing interest and supporting the bid. Those who turned away responded minimally or even ignored the bid or expressed contempt and saying, that's stupid, stop bothering me. Those bidding interactions had profound effect on the marriage's well-being. And he goes on to comment in this study how individuals that respond to those bids, those little hints that are dropped, if you respond to them, he did this study over six years. He said over a period of six years, he said, 
uh, 87% of those marriages were, were thriving. Those that did not respond to the bids, only 33% considered themselves to be healthy at all. You know, we have, a, we have an opportunity to engage our spouse daily, hourly. We need to do everything we can to, to allure them to us, to, to attract them to a closer relationship with us. So much to the point where Hosea says, I will draw you into the desert that I may speak tenderly to you. The second thing he says he's going to do, it's in verse 15. He says, I will give her something. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, I will give her back her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door, a door of hope. Hope, H-O-P-E. That's where we see some light come into this chapter in this book. This is the first glimmer of, of, of something positive. Hosea is saying to Gomer, Gomer, I want to give you something. In, in the Bible, throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, God often changed uh, people's names to reflect a change in behavior, a change in circumstances. You know, probably the most clear example is, is, is Abraham. Abram. He began as Abram. God changed his name to Abraham. Uh, we see other examples. We say Jacob began as Jacob. He became Israel. Go to the New Testament. We see uh, Simon. Simon became Peter. We see Saul became Paul. Oftentimes, God changes people's names to reflect a change, a change that's taking place. And here he says in verse 15, he says, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Achor simply means trouble. That's what it means. The valley of trouble is what it, what it literally says. I'm going to make the valley of trouble a doorway of hope for you. And he says to that, I will also give you back, I will give you back your vineyards. Here, Gomer, Israel, and all of us have, have a greater hope. I read somewhere this week, maybe you saw this as well. Due to budget cuts, the light at the end of the tunnel has now been turned off. Have you heard that? That's, that's reality, isn't it? That's reality for, for us in so many places, and yet not when God is on your side. Hosea says that I will give you vineyards. I will, I will give you once again a song to sing as in the days of your youth. I don't know if, if, if you're at a point in your life right now where there are matters to you that are, that are hopeless, some difficult things in your life right now. You know, it's... it's it's interesting coming in here every Sunday morning because you don't know who's hopeless this week. <laughs> Maybe you were hopeless last week. Maybe some of you will be hopeless about something next week. If you're here this morning and if this is your day to be hopeless over a matter in your life, whether it be with a relationship, whether it be something at work, whether it be whatever it is, if today's your day to be hopeless, may you hear that God wants to change you from being a valley of troubles into a doorway of hope. That's what we have when we have God. That doesn't mean that everything just gets wiped clean and you start fresh tomorrow morning, no problems at all. That's not what it means at all. But it means that he journeys with us, journeys with us through those things. So he says, I'm going to lure you and I'm going to give back to you some hope. Third thing he says here, verse 17, he says, He says, I want to take something away from you. Verse 17, he says, I will remove the names of Baal from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. Hosea is saying to Gomer here, but more importantly, God is saying this to Israel. God is announcing an end to the idolatry of his people. We cannot... We cannot enter back into a relationship, God says, if you still have any allegiance to Baal. Because God cannot coexist with anyone else in his position in your life. And in the case of Gomer, Gomer, you cannot have these other lovers and expect to have me as well. It just can't be. I love this song, uh, as many of you do. God is jealous for me, David Crowder writes. He is jealous for me. Love like a hurricane, I am a tree. 
bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. It's, it's a, he's trying to draw a picture in that song. He's trying to draw a picture. You know, how can we picture the love of God? How do you picture love at all? It's such a, it's, it's intangible. How do you picture love? He describes it as a hurricane. God's love is a hurricane and I am a tree. And I am bending. I am bending and swaying beneath the weight of his mercy. That's, that's, God loves us. And I don't know how, how to convey that any better than as Crowder does. The picture of his hurricane. I want to give to you. I want to take from you, he says. Fourth thing, um, Hosea says here in verse 19, he says, I will betroth you. I will betroth you. He says in verse 19, he says, I will betroth you uh, forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and in compassion. says it again in verse 20. He says, I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge, you will acknowledge the Lord. Betroth simply means to make a promise or a commitment a commitment of marriage. The New Living Translation, if you are holding one of those in your lap today, it says, I will make you my wife forever, is what Hosea writes. Notice what he's not saying there. Hosea is not saying to Gomer, Gomer, why don't you come back for a while and we'll give it a try. Why don't you come back for a while and we'll, we'll see how things go for the first few months. And if you come back for a while, and if we give it a try, and if it doesn't work, at least we can say, hey, we gave it our best try. He's not saying that. He makes it very clear. Gomer, come back. I will make you my wife forever. I expect that some of you have had quite a rocky relationship with God. I expect some of you have had your ups and your downs with God. I expect that some of you have had probably more downs and ups in your relationship with God. Please see today that God is just as passionate about being betrothed or to be committed to you as he has ever been. He longs, God longs as a young man longs for his bride. He longs to be in that relationship with us. Donald Barnhouse was a Presbyterian preacher, died back 50 or 60 years ago. In his book on Romans, he he writes these words, The pursuing love of God is the greatest wonder of the spiritual universe. You hear that? The pursuing love of God is the greatest wonder in the spiritual universe. We leave God in the heat of our own self-desire and we run. We run because we want so much more to have our own way than God's ways. We go at our crossroads and we look back in pride, thinking that we have outdistanced ourselves from God, but just as we are about to congratulate ourselves on our achievements of self-enthronement, we feel a touch. We feel a touch on our arm and we turn in that direction and we find him there. My child, he says, in great tenderness, I love you. And when I saw you running away from all that is good, I pursued you through the shortcut that love knows well. And I await for you here at the crossroads. God waits at the crossroads for us. You've maybe tried to distance yourself from God. Well, God's God's going to meet you at the crossroads. He's going to remind you that he loves you and he's just committed to you at the crossroads as he was when you first left. What a great statement. The pursuing love of God is the greatest wonder in the spiritual universe. The last thing that I'll mention in terms of a promise that Hosea gives to Gomer is that I will show you my love. He says in verse 23, in verse 23 it says, uh, I will... I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. Isn't that an interesting statement? I will show my love to the one that I had called, not my loved one. Even though you don't live right, 
Gomer, even though you don't live right, Israel, I'm still going to show you my love. I'm still going to love you as I ever have. It's not easy loving someone who doesn't want to be loved. It's not easy loving someone that doesn't love you. I read a story in the news recently about a, a Florida judge who handed down a rather unusual sentence for uh, a husband who had been in a, a domestic dispute with his wife where he'd actually shoved his wife and the police were called and uh, uh, it ended up before a judge. And uh, the judge sentenced him. This is what he sentenced him to. He said that he had to get marriage counseling. But before he got the marriage counseling, what he had to do, he had to go out and buy his wife some flowers He had to get her a card and write her a nice card, take her to Red Lobster, it was specifically Red Lobster, and then take her bowling. (laughs) That was what he had to do, and that was written right out. And so his attorney stood up and said, does he have to let her win? (laughs) The judge was not impressed. He said, I'm serious. (laughs) I wish I knew the end of that story. I wish I knew the end of the story and, and learned that, yeah, they, they went out and they did bowling and she beat him and they fell in love again and all their problems were gone and yet I don't know the end of the story. I don't know any more of the story than what I've just said. But I do know that God, God loves you right now, no matter what your situation is. No matter what your situation is, God's love for you is there and he wants to show that love to you. If Hosea can still love his unfaithful wife, God can love every one of us. And if you are not connected right now with God as you should be, please be aware that he is pursuing you. In the movies, you hear people uh, convey that they feel somebody's following them. I've never had that feeling where someone's following me. And yet God is pursuing you if you are not in the place that you should be with God. And God will do whatever he can to allure you. He will do whatever he can to allure you. Do you know what God might do? God might have to allure some of you into the desert. That's what he said in verse 14. He might have to allure you or lead you into the desert. And do you know what? The desert is not a good place to be. Unless it's Glendale, Arizona. And of course, that's where the Super Bowl is this afternoon. But that's that's different. That's kind of an oasis, isn't it? The desert is not a good place to be. The desert is a place where desperate people end up. And yet that's where God may have to lead some of us. And if he leads us there, he wants to speak to us. As it says in that verse, he wants to speak to us tenderly to remind us that he does love us. In 1873, Francis Thompson wrote a book, didn't write a book, wrote a poem that's become a classic. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's called The Hound of Heaven. It's, it's 182 lines long, and it's become, a, it's become a Christian classic. I think we're all familiar with what a hound would do, a hound dog would do. A hound dog is, is relentless, is determined that they will, they will search out the prey that they've been instructed to, to find. And so Thompson wrote this song, The Hound of Heaven. It's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult poem. It's difficult for a couple of reasons. It's difficult because it's written in Old English and it takes a while to work through it and understand it. But it's difficult also because of the message, the message that it conveys. Someone has suggested it's probably one of the most loved And yet one of the most difficult uh, Christian poems of all time. The opening lines go just like this. And and again, it's a long poem. I'm not going to read it. But I do want to read the first opening lines. And then I want to read just a statement from from the last stanza. 
It begins by saying, I, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the libreth way of my own mind. And in the midst of my tears, I hid from him under my running laughter. I hid from him. I hid from him. I ran from him. I fled from him. The whole first part of the song deals with that. Just running from God. Just trying to avoid God. And yet there's a great line in the last stanza. And this is what it says. It says, it asks a question. And you would do well to remember this question. Is my gloom, after all, the shade of his hand outstretched caressingly? Is my gloom the shade of his outstretched hand caressing me? We talk about, we talk about having a cloud. I feel like I've got a cloud over me today. Cartoons. Cartoons depict that well. Someone's having a bad day. They've got this black cloud over them. And, and some of you and, and, and me, we have days we feel there's a black cloud over us. And what is it? What's with it? Thompson would suggest that it might be the hound of heaven. With his outstretched hand reaching out to us. You know what? God does that. God does that. If we're not walking with him in the way that we should be. If we're not connected with him. We are so important to him. That he will run after us. And he will reach out to us. And what would appear to be a a bad day. Might be just God himself. His shadow over our lives. That's how much he loves us. Well I'm going to let you be the decider. If. If Hosea chapter 3 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. It is a great chapter. There's no sense in doing anything that we've done to this point. If we don't look at chapter 3. So I hope that you'll be here next week. Because it really brings this whole love story. Full circle. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that we could wake up this morning to just a beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you for the sun and just how it reflects off the snow and just makes this day just illuminate. And yet, Father, I know that it's very possible that maybe someone came in here today with with a, a seemingly black cloud over their head on such a beautiful day. And Father, I pray that if there be anyone here today that just feels just the weight of your shadow on them. I pray, Lord, that they would acknowledge it. That they would acknowledge that this could be you just pursuing us. And Father, we thank you that you meet us at the crossroads. Those junctures in our life where we sometimes choose to go down wrong roads. Lord, I thank you that you're, you're at the next crossroads as well. And then you're, you're at the next crossroads as well. And yet, Father, I pray that we might meet you there today. Thank you for Hosea. Thank you, Lord, for his love for his people and his love for his wife. Lord, may we understand it in our own lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.